thank you very much for having me and thank you for the introduction, Bjorn. Um, so as I understand, not everybody here is uh, familiar with uh, theoretical evolutionary biology. So I thought I would first give a quick introduction to the field of evolutionary ecology. And then about one method that is common to study it when individuals interact uh, non-randomly due to spatial factors. And then I'll go briefly over two results uh, in such a case uh, that connect to my own work. All right, so while ecology aims to understand the interactions between individuals and the environments, Evolution uh, really refers to changes in gene frequency or traits within populations over time. So evolutionary ecology seeks to explain how organisms interact with one another and their environments in terms of evolutionary processes, and in particular in terms of natural selection. And this is a very old and diverse field that, no, that has um, somewhat received some <laughs> fresh renewed interest, both empirically and theoretically, under the banner of uh, so-called eco-evolutionary dynamics. And eco-evolutionary dynamics refers simply to the notion that evolutionary changes, so evolutionary changes in a genetic trait, depends on environmental or ecological conditions that are themselves influenced by genes. And so this interplay leads to a, a feedback that ties together genetic evolution and ecological dynamics. So for, for, for example, one could be looking at uh, how predator preferences um, influence prey distributions. And in turn, these changes in prey distribution would change the way selection operates on prey choice. Another example uh, could be that you are interested in investigating how demographic characteristic um, influence the evolution of uh, social behaviors, such as helping behaviors or cooperative breeding that can further entail demographic changes. But just but broadly, the, you can really classify these feedback as, as to whether they are extrinsic, so when they occur between species or via some uh, environmental variable, but also, uh, but feedbacks can also be intrinsic, so within species. Okay, it, it just occurred to me that I forgot to mention that please feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have a question. I really don't mind if you unmute yourselves and, uh, and stop me on my way. Okay, but so whether the um, feedbacks are extrinsic or intrinsic, the study uh, of these has been the focus of really many evolutionary ecology studies. And these um, two references that I've put below here on this slide offer really useful reviews about how different theoretical frameworks have been used over the last 50 years. But broadly speaking, uh, these studies really seek to track joint changes in genetic traits and ecologically relevant conditions. So in a really loosely, you can represent what they want to look at as a coupled dynamical equation. Then the challenge or the scientific interest really is to be able to say, can we say a little bit more about the nature of these dynamics than just looking at these uh, coupled equation? And so one, one framework that has been particularly useful in disentangling these is um, the so-called adaptive dynamics framework. Okay? And models using this framework rely on a separation of timescales between ecological and evolutionary dynamics. So specifically, um, the, these models assume that mutations are so rare that uh, the ecology is always on its attractor, okay? So that the evolutionary dynamics take the form of a sequence of allele substitutions. Maybe to see this a bit more explicitly, so imagine a population that starts uh, monomorphic for a given trait, okay? And this trait has value Z1 here. And let's say uh, this population stays for this uh, monomorphic for a long time, no mutations are occurring, so that this gives sufficient amount of time for the ecological variable, for instance, the density of a resource, to reach some kind of attractor, okay? And this attractor depends on Z1. And I've, so I've denoted here by an epsilon hat 
Now, this attractor can be more complicated, okay, than a stable point. It could be uh, a, a stable, like a limit cycle, for example. Okay, now imagine a single copy mutant arrives in this population, and let's say it's straight as Z2. Then either this mutant is lost rapidly or it invades the population according to its invasion fitness. And I've denoted this invasion fitness as lambda because it is often the um, leading eigenvalue of a matrix, okay? This matrix that gives you the expected change in the number of mutants when where. But without going into the details, one fantastic result from uh, adaptive dynamics is that provided that the difference between the mutant and the resident is sufficiently small, okay, provided that Z1 and Z2 are sufficiently similar, then a mutant that invades also fixes and therefore becomes the new resident. And then this population can also equilibrate for its own ecological attractor that now depends on Z2. Okay, so this process keeps going on um, so that you can study the gradual evolution in this population via a succession of substitution of mutants, where at each time, at each step, the ecological value variable is evaluated at an attractor given by the resident. But essentially, perhaps uh, clearer to see is essentially what you've done is reduce coupled eco-evolutionary dynamics to a single dynamical equation, which is much simpler to study. And this, dynamic, this dynamical system allows to investigate two key properties of natural selection and its effect on evolution. Okay, so first the population evolves under directional selection via the substitution sequence. And the direction of evolution in the sequence is given by the sign of the selection gradient, S, okay? And S is given by the marginal change in invasion fitness. And the population evolves in this way until it reaches um, an equilibrium, so a value Z star, such that the selection gradient vanishes and its derivative is negative. And once the population expresses such, uh, such evolutionary tractor, two things can happen depending on the uh, second order derivative of invasion fitness, which is sometimes referred to as the coefficient of quad quadratic selection and which I've denoted here by H. Okay, so when H is negative, this means that selection is stabilizing. So selection, selection basically purges any mutation that is different to the resident. So the population is uninvadable and uh, an equilibrium that satisfies this condition really uh, represents a peak in the adaptive landscape. When, it is, uh, when H is positive, however, selection is disruptive. And this means that the population will become dimorphic um, in a process that is known as evolutionary branching because the as you can see on the graph here, the population branches out like a, an evolutionary tree. And this diversification is due to a particular feedback between evolution and ecology, whereby gradual evolution has led to an ecological situation such that any rare mutant that is different to the resident is favored by uh, negative frequency dependent selection. And this type of process can actually occur uh, under a multitude of, um, of interaction, it'll be host parasites, uh, coevolution, or predator prey coevolution. Okay, but the directional and quadratic selection gradients, uh, so S and H, are both important quantities to understand eco evolutionary dynamics, and they both depend on invasion fitness lambda. So the challenge then is to characterize invasion fitness and these gradients in a biologically meaningful way. Okay, so I, I mentioned earlier that in, uh, in invasion fitness is typically the eigenvalue of a matrix. And this matrix can be extremely complicated depending on the model you're looking at. But in one particular case, it is actually possible to find a simple interpretation for invasion fitness. And this is typically the case when populations are well mixed. Okay, so in other words, 
when individuals interact with one another like particles in a gas. Uh, and without going into the details, um, why this makes the ma mathematics much simpler, it's because you can assume that a rare mutant in a large well-mixed population never interacts with another rare mutant. And also that it has little impact on the ecological variable of interest. So in this case, invasion fitness is in fact simply individual fitness. That is the expected number of offspring of a mutant in a resident population, which I'll denote here by a, a small w. And in ecology, this quantity is often referred to as the per capita growth rate. And this result is important because individual fitness really is the fundamental currency of evolutionary ecology. When, when you go and, and measure the fitness effect of a trait or of a behavior, it is on individual fitness, not on, on gene or invasion fitness. But the, the problem uh, with this view is that due to the physical limitations of movements and interaction, uh, most of life is in fact uh, spatially structured. So rather than particles in a gas, populations rather consist of, of smaller groups that tend to be genetically similar with associated environmental conditions that uh, can be influenced mostly by the local genetic pool and not the whole genetic pool. So what makes eco-evolutionary more complicated uh, in such a situation is that a mutant that is rare globally can nevertheless be locally frequent. Okay, so as a result, um, selection depends on mutant-mutant interactions, so interactions between mutants. And there are two types of interactions that are relevant depending on the type of trait that is evolving and the type of feedback taking place. So imagine you are modeling a, or you're interested in the evolution of a trait that mediates direct interactions between individuals, so such as helping or harming. So you're looking at an intrinsic, intrinsic feedback. So you need to take into account in this case how often mutants directly interact with one another in the same patch. If you are interested in the evolution of traits that influence an ecological variable, such as the uh, local density of a resource, and therefore looking at an uh, extrinsic feedback, then you are going to need to characterize these indirect mutant-mutant interactions via your ecological variable of interest. And in particular, now the local ecological variable is no longer set only by the resonant trait, but also by the mutant trait. And so a bit later today, what I'm going to do is present the results of two studies uh, that I've been involved in that each illustrate some of the implications of these direct and indirect mutant, mutant interactions um, for, for, for eco-evolutionary dynamics. And before I get into, uh, into more detail about these studies, um, I'll just introduce the island model uh, on, on which both of these studies are based. Okay, so the island model reduces the complexity of space as much as possible to only keep what matters the most, okay, which is, remember, mutant-mutant interactions. And the island model has a long history being introduced by Cyril Wright in the 30s, uh, in order to support his shifting balance theory, but has since then been uh, used for, by many other models from population to quantitative genetics, as well as purely ecological models. Okay, so the infinite island model sees the population um, as an infinite collection of groups or islands, each with a finite number of individuals. And the key assumption in this model is that if an individual leaves its natal patch, it's equally likely to land in any other patch. So spatial structure in this model is only implicit. You, so you, you have, of course, many models with explicit space, such as uh, lattice, or network models. But these are significantly more difficult to track because of isolation by distance. But the good news is, is that so far, um, 
um, results on uh, the evolution of different traits, such as sex ratio or helping, have been, been, have been qualitatively equivalent between models without or without explicit space. Okay, so this suggests that really the island model, even though it's unrealistic, it can provide very useful insights for most complicated spatial landscapes. Now, <clears throat> sorry. The first complication of spatial structure is that individual fitness, uh, so the, remember the expected number of offspring that a, an individual has, can no longer be written just as a function of the mutant and resident phenotype. Rather, uh, here the uh, individual fitness of a focal depends on its own phenotype, which I've denoted by YF, as well as a vector uh, YN that collects the phenotypes of all its neighbors, here, which I've just listed as Y1, Y2, and so on. And finally, it also depends on the phenotypes in the rest of the population, but these can be actually assumed to be fixed for the resident. So we only need to consider uh, genetic variation in the focal patch and not the global population. And in this talk, I'm going to assume that all patches are homogeneous for simplicity, so that there are no exogenous differences among patches and between individuals other than genetic. So in particular, all patches have the same fixed number of individuals, and there is no age or sex structure in the population. But many of the present, many, so, but you know, many of the results that I will present today can be naturally extended to these cases, um, uh, barring some, some notational and mathematical headaches. Okay, so because the fitness function is going to crop up again and again, I'm going to keep it in the lower corner uh, here, in the lower left corner here, as a reminder. I don't know if you can see my mouse hovering about. All right, so the first result I'd like to present uh, are the directional and quadratic selection gradient in this island model of dispersal in the absence of extrinsic feedbacks, okay? And when these were published, um, these results were not new, but rather solidified existing results by using different methods, which also helped in the interpretation of the different components of selection. All right, so working from invasion fitness lambda in the island model, the directional selection gradient, which remember uh, tells you about the direction of selection of evolution, can be written uh, like this, like I've shown on, on the slide. Okay, so the first derivative here is the effect that an individual switching from the resident to the mutant has on its own fitness. The second derivative is the effect that a neighbor switching from uh, the resident to the mutant has on the fitness of the focal individual. And here I've just denoted arbitrarily this neighbor as Y1. And this indirect fitness effect is multiplied or weighted by uh, a relatedness R2. And this is defined as the probability that two individuals randomly sampled in the same resident patch carry the same allele at a given locus. So to the zeroth order, this probability gives you the relative frequency of mutant-mutant interactions within patches. That is how often will um, one mutant interact with another mutant to the zeroth order, so approximately, approximated as in the resident population. And this whole expression is the so-called inclusive fitness effect of the trait. And this has been, been derived many times using uh, many different methods. It really is a classical result in evolutionary biology. So if you could not remember anything from this talk, just remember this. And this was first discovered by uh, Bill Hamilton in the 60s, who used it to explain the evolution of altruism and really gave social evolution, its theoretical foundation. And in, because in particular, this shows that genetic altruism can evolve if the cost for one individual to help its neighbor is offset by the benefits received by its genetic relatives. 
But beyond altruism and more broadly, this perspective really helps to interpret the forces at play in trait evolution under mutant-mutant interactions. It doesn't have to be altruism. It can be any traits uh, that mediate interactions between individuals. And it also comes with the computational advantages because relatedness is a classical quantity of population genetics so that there exists many, many uh, methods to calculate it for different models. And in a way, perhaps more importantly, uh, this is the only quantity on this slide and perhaps in my whole talk that is actually easy to estimate in natural population from pedigree or genetic data. Okay, but perhaps less well known that the directional selection gradient is the quadratic selection gradient. So recall, uh, which uh, remember tells you whether a population will remain monomorphic or become polymorphic. And we find that this uh, term H can be decomposed as the sum of two terms. All right, the first consists of various second order effects of changes in traits within the focal patch that I'm gonna go over quickly because I don't wanna to focus too much on this term today. So don't worry, it, it, don't, so don't worry if, it's too, um, if it's not too clear. But in any case, the first term here is the effect of a second, or is a second order effect of a train change in the focal on its own fitness, okay? Like, like in a well-mixed, population. All the other terms I'm going to present are due to spatial structure. Okay, so the, these first two derivatives due to spatial structure consist of the effect on focal fitness of a change in its neighbors, as well as the effect of coupled changes in the focal and in the, in the neighbor. And both are multiplied by relatedness R2 of the resident population. Finally, uh, the third derivative is the effect on focal fitness of a joint change in two different neighbors, here labeled just one and two. And this effect is weighted by the probability R3, which is uh, the probability that these two neighbors plus the focal are all, related, are all <laughs> relatives. And again, uh, R3 here, is evaluated in the resident population. So overall, uh, other than the first very first term, this expression consists of fitness effects due to mutant-mutant interactions that are similar in nature, due, um, that are similar to resident-resident interaction, okay? Because R2 and R3 are evaluated at the resident uh, trade value. The second term that uh, participates to quadratic selection here, HR, and this is the one I'd like to focus on today. This consists of the product between two things. And the first one, as we saw earlier, is the effect of a train change in a neighbor on focal fitness. So for instance, if this trait is helping, uh, this effect would be positive. And this is multiplied to this term here, dr2 uh, by dy, which is the effect of a change in the, in the mutant trait on the relate, sorry, which is the effect of a trait on the relatedness amongst mutants. Okay, so if the trait leads to mutants to be more related in a, than the resident in the resident population, this term would be positive. So in other words, this term HR captures how the evolving trait influences mutant-mutant interactions and leads to preferential interactions. And in the context of polymorphism, this shows that polymorphism will be favored when a trait both decreases the fitness of neighbors, like harming, and decreases the probability that these neighbors are relatives. Conversely, it also favors polymorphism where the trait increases the fitness of neighbors, like helping, and increases the probability that the individuals uh, uh, 
being helped are relatives. Okay, perhaps to make this, uh, so to make this point more um, explicit, I just want to go over quickly a simple model. Okay, so let's, let's imagine a population whose life cycle starts with had adults um, helping one another. And according to these interactions, they reap material payoffs that influence the number of offspring they produce, and then they die. Offspring that either disperse or remain in their natal patch according to an evolving probability Z. And we're going to assume that dispersal comes at a cost uh, in the sense that uh, there's a certain probability of dying before reaching another patch if you disperse. And finally, the offspring in each patch uh, compete to become adults. And for this simple model, we're going to look at the evolution of dispersal when it trades off with helping. Okay, so that individuals that have invested energy into dispersal have less uh, energy or resources to invest into helping. So what this means is that mutants that disperse more, so not only decrease uh, their relatedness and mutant, mutant, and the frequency of mutant, mutant interactions, they also decrease the fitness of neighbors by helping less. So looking at the, uh, looking at the directional selection gradient, we find that for a large chunk of the parameter space in this model, uh, the following properties. So the first is that as dispersal cost increases, the shown here on the x-axis, the evolutionary attractive values for dispersal shown on the y-axis decreases. And naturally, as dispersal uh, decreases, relatedness increases. So, so far, nothing surprising or actually new. What is new, however, is that while dispersal in the homogeneous island model is typically evolutionary stable, so under stabilizing selection, here we find that uh, when looking at the quadratic selection gradient for this model, that selection is disruptive when the dispersal cost is low. Okay, and performal and an individual based simulation confirm this. Okay, so for, for instance, here I'm showing uh, the results of simulations when selection is predicted to be stabilizing. And so on, on the x axis, you have generations, and on the y axis, you have the uh, trait um, of dispersal of each individual in the population, starting with z equals zero. And we see that the population evolves uh, gradually and eventually stays unimodal around the evolutionary attractor, which is about uh, 0 0.25 here. So by contrast, for parameters under which selection is disrupt disruptive, we see that after the population has converged to its evolutionary attractor, which is also around 0 0.3 here, or, a bit high, or 0 0.4, uh, the population then undergoes an evolutionary branching and stabilizes uh, with two morphs coexisting with one another. The first morph consists of individuals that are more dispersive and selfish, uh, while the other is more sessile and benevolent. And this social polymorphism emerges because by dispersing less, benevolent individual, individuals preferentially interact with relatives. And by being more dispersive, selfish individuals preferentially interact with non-relatives. But more broadly, I think uh, what I hope to illustrate with this example is that under spatial structure, the effects of traits on relatedness and therefore on mutant-mutant interactions can have significant effects on eco-evolutionary dynamics, and in particular can lead to interesting social polymorphism. <clears throat> okay, so while the, these previous results dealt with an intrinsic feedback, so when the trait inputs the characteristic of the evolving population, the next result I'd like to present concerns an extrinsic feedback. So when the trait, the trait influences an external ecological variable, and this is the work of Iris Prigent, who, who started a PhD in our lab, uh, 
And although she's been deriving both the directional and quadratic selection gradients, I'm only going to present directional uh, um, selection today. And if you're interested, feel free to contact uh, Iris. All right, so to incorporate local ecological effects, we're going to assume that each patch is characterized now by an ecological variable epsilon. So this could be the local density of a praise or the level of pH in the soil. Then in addition to depend on its own trait and that of its neighbors, the fitness of an individual now also depends on the local ecological variable of its patch in its generation, so say T. And for ecological dynamics, we're going to assume that from one generation to the next, the ecological variable uh, is given by a mapping F here of two variables. One is the average trait in the patch, and the other is the local ecological variable uh, at the previous generation. So this allows you to capture quite a wide range uh, of, uh, of ecological dynamics. We nevertheless assume that in a monomorphic po population, this mapping is such that it converges to an ecological attractor, which we denote here by epsilon hat. And again, to remember these functions, I'm going to keep them in the bottom left corner here. Uh, also, it's conceptually, we should, uh, the directional selection gradient in this case has, has already been derived in the papers that are cited here. And these studies use uh, a different met methods, use different methods, and sometimes slightly different assumptions, but eventually they they all converge to a similar result that, I, that I'm going to present now. So again, working from invasion fitness, we find that the directional selection gradient can be decomposed as the sum of two terms. Okay, the first term is the classical selection gradient that we saw earlier in the absence of local ecological effect, okay, which remember incorporates direct, direct, uh, direct mutant, mutant interactions. So interactions between mutants uh, that live in the same generation. The second term, which can be written like this, uh, where M is the dispersal probability and N is the patch size, in fact, captures selection on intertemporal ecological effects. So to, to see this, let me introduce some notation in the bottom uh, here, uh, FG, uh, is the ecological effects of traits of, uh, of a one generation. So how change in the average trait influences the ecological variable of a one generation. While FE captures the effect of ecological inheritance. Okay, so, so to see this, when FE is zero, the ecological variable at one generation is actually independent from, 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 from the previous generation. But when FE is positive, the local ecological variables are positively associated between generations. So in other words, ecological factors are inherited or transmitted from one generation to the next. Okay, so looking at the uh, first derivative of, uh, of this expression here, SE, in SE, we see that this is simply the effect of a change in the ecological variable on the fitness of an individual. So for instance, increasing the density of a resource would typically uh, increase the fitness of individuals. And this is multiplied to uh, this big expression here, which turns out to be the effect of a focal individual on the ecological variable experienced by all its downstream relatives living in the same patch. This may be not obvious, but we can see this sli slightly more explicitly if we unpack this term as an infinite sum, which uh, a sum which starts with FG, okay, so that's the ecological effect that the mutant has over one generation. And this effect that ripples through gener uh, generations due to ecological inheritance and affect the downstream relatives of this initial mutant via ecological 
modification to a degree given by um, R2 bar times one minus NT, okay? But taking a step back and maybe <laughs> less close to the equation, this part of the selection gradient captures selection due to indirect mutant-mutant interactions via ecological inheritance. And what it suggests is that selection will take into account the effect that mutants have on one another across generations when these remain preferentially in the same patch. To see this uh, more explicitly, we're going to look briefly at a simple model uh, on the evolution of resource consumption. So for this, we assume that each patch has a non-essential resource uh, that with density epsilon. So it is non-essential in the sense that individuals can survive and reproduce even in the absence of, the res res of this resource. Okay, the, this resource just provides a fitness bonus. Individuals attack or consume these resources uh, at a rate Z, uh, and we're gonna assume that this, the higher the rate, the more costly it is, maybe because the, these resources are difficult to, to, to access. And this is the trait that's going to be evolving. Then we assume that from one generation to the next, resources uh, that have not been consumed renew at a rate R naught, so that the resource has a kind of type two response function to consumption. And the renewal rate R naught uh, really modulates the effects of ecological inheritance. Okay, so because if resources renew really quickly, then it doesn't matter what individuals have done uh, to it in the previous generation, it simply renews itself. Uh, rapidly enough. After consumption, individuals re uh, reproduce depending on the amounts of resources they have gathered and then they die. So generations are non-overlapping. Finally, offspring, their offspring either disperse or remain in the patch according to a fixed probability here M. <clears throat> okay, um, so what, what we can then easily solve actually the selection gradient to find the evolutionary and associated ecological attracted for different renewal rates and dispersal values. So, okay, so, so here on the x-axis, we have dispersal rate. And on the top graph, uh, the equilibrium attack rates for different uh, rates of renewal. And on the bottom, the equilibrium level of resources that these attack rates generate. And the main thing uh, that I want to uh, point out in these graphs is that selection always leads to greater uh, attack and or consumption and can lead to the complete depletion of resources when dispersal is greater. So for instance, here are the results of a simulation under pan mixture, so with full dispersal when R0 equals two. And we see that over generations, evolution leads to uh, consumption in, in, in blue that uh, completely depletes the resource, the local resource shown here in orange. But by contrast, when dispersal is very low, uh, the attack rate that evolves actually allows for the long-term maintenance of the resource. And this is because when dispersal is very limited, an individual's overconsumption directly impacts the fitness of its downstream relatives who remain in the same patch. So selection takes these indirect interactions into account and favors mutants that are more cautious with resources. And this is true in particular when the renewal rate is low so that ecological inheritance is high. But more generally, what I want to convey here is that spatial structure and limited dispersal again can lead to very contrasted outcome for uh, evolution and its ecological consequences. Okay, so to, to conclude, I hope I have uh, conveyed that non-random interactions due to spatial structure can have important implications for eco-evolutionary dynamics. This is really not a new point to make with almost all of social and dispersal evolution since the 60s based on this, uh, on this notion. 
but I think it's, it's worth reinforcing. And for instance, because sometimes I hear that models in well-mixed populations are able to capture selection due to all possible ecological feedbacks, but, but this is not true. Of course, it is true that what one can, in principle, investigate numerically the adaptive dynamics of a given model by calculating the invasion fitness for this model. But for many problems of interest, actually, the, the, this computational approach is too expensive because the, the state space in which a mutant can be is too large. And perhaps more, on a more conceptual level, I think as, as a theoretical biologist, I'm not so much um, interested in calculating things. Rather, I want to understand biological processes using mathematical approaches. And this requires decomposing processes into easily interpretable and preferably already established biological concepts such as relatedness. And for instance, using the concept of relatedness here, we showed that we can decompose and understand the directional and quadratic selection gradients from adaptive dynamics according to direct and indirect mutant-mutant interactions. And as in the two examples I, I went through, both types of interactions can have uh, significant effects on the way that natural selection shapes traits and how individuals interact with the environments in line with classical social evolution theory established by Hamilton. Uh, so on this, I would like to uh, thank Iris Prigent for her work and uh, all the collaborators with whom uh, I have, um, who have participated in this work, especially Laurent Lehmann, but also Laurent Kellari, Sashi, Otsuki, Hiroshi Ito, and Joe Wakano, and uh, Yuliel and the SNF for funding, and you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>